Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the third Shiny Gathering. For those who are joining us new, Shiny Gathering is a community live streaming session that happens on the last Thursday of every month. And today's session is all about Rhino with none other than Camille Jua, who's one of the primary authors of Rhino. He was actually developing Rhino before uh, even Rhino package existed. And he's been building Rhino since its inception. And you might have seen him conducting workshops and introducing Rhino in conferences. And just a quick reminder, we have some time for Q&A at the end. So feel free to ask any relevant questions in the chat and we'll make sure to address them. We will also be joined by Kuba Novitsky, who is our open source lead at Absalon. So the Q&A is a great place to ask some questions related to open source too. So I'm so happy to introduce Camille. Hello. Hello, thanks uh, for the introduction. Uh, all right, I think you can see my screen now, so let's get started. Uh, today we'll be talking uh, about best practices for coding Shiny apps uh, we using Rhino. Uh, and I intend this to be an overview of several topics which I find the most important about uh, Rhino. Uh, I will be definitely not covering in breadth everything because uh, there is just not enough time for that. And uh, I have in mind about 40 minutes for this presentation. Then you should have about 20 minutes for Q&A. And, and that's where Jakub Nowitzki will join us too. So uh, you might uh, answer questions to, about our wider open source uh, as well. All right. So uh, and one quick uh, um, announcement uh, here too. Uh, I'm going to also give you a couple of teasers uh, for the upcoming release of Rhino 1.4. Uh, I will drop them in the places where they seem related to, to the topic uh, at hand. Uh, another quick note, uh, I will not be actually doing any leaf coding uh, today. Uh, the plan was actually to do some leaf presentation of what running some of the Rhino functions look like. In the end, I figured uh, there's just not enough time to fit that properly into this presentation. So I'm just going to go uh, along with the slides. All right. So the agenda for today and five topics that I'd like to cover. First of all, introduction. What is Rhino? How do we install it? How do you initialize it? A general overview. What, what is Rhino uh, from the perspective of a newcomer? Uh, then we'll talk about modular, modularization, how Fox modules and Shiny modules are utilized in Rhino. We'll talk about dependencies and what kind of setup uh, Rhino uses. SAS and JavaScript development. SAS is something that you'll need very commonly. JavaScript, perhaps a bit more advanced topic, but it fits here very well. And lastly, testing, something absolutely crucial for long-term health of any software engineering project. All right, let's start with a general introduction. And first of all, what is Rhino? So we keep saying that it's a framework for enterprise shiny apps. And what do we mean by that? Because a framework is kind of big word. Uh, you can understand many things through that. Uh, and what, what do we mean with this enterprise here? So Starting with a little bit of history, uh, when we started using Shiny in Absalon for developing projects for our clients, we really liked how quick it was to start and how simple, uh, how simply you could have a project with some uh, interactivity to, to showcase some of your results. Uh, you could start with a single file and you would be good to go. But uh, this approach, of course, did not scale and as the project was uh, continuing, we would need to structure it properly. We would need various tools to make sure we keep its quality uh, to certain standards. And in general, we needed various type of configuration to make sure everything works together. And out of this uh, grew a need for something reusable, some setup, some framework that could be used for all subsequent projects 
where we could think about uh, the good practices that we want to apply, the tools that we want to use, and think about them just once and keep applying them in subsequent projects. So Rhino gives you three main things. Uh, first of all, it comes with a complete project structure. So places for you to keep all the sources of your application, your tests, uh, configuration, and so on. It also includes complete development toolbox, everything that you will need to, from linters to test runners and configuration and so on. And lastly, thanks to this uh, set of tools and the structure, it encourages you to use good practices in your coding. And this is what we mean uh, by framework and being for enterprise. But uh, technically, Rhino is just an R package. And to start working with it, you will need to just install it. And installation of Rhino looks like installation of any other R package. You can just use the install packages function with Rhino and you're good to go. Now, all the other functionalities and all of this talk uh, happens in context of a Rhino project. Uh, so a Rhino project, as mentioned, is some directory structure with tools inside and so on. To create such a structure, you need to initialize it. And to do that, you have two options. Either you open RStudio and use new project wizard. Uh, and there you can choose Rhino as a template for a project. Or you call the Rhino init function, which will do exactly the same thing. Once you do that, you'll end up with a directory structure that looks somewhat like this. Uh, this may seem like a lot. Uh, don't worry about it. You do not need to know, know to know about every single piece here. For readability, the files that you can see here are grouped into several categories. In subsequent sections, I'll take a look at some of them. For now, uh, only you only need to know that uh, Rhino application is still a shiny application. So running and deployment of Rhino application is pretty much the same thing as vanilla Shiny. To run your application in RStudio, you just need to click the Run App button, which appears when you open the app.r file. Alternatively, you can also go to R console and use Shiny Run App, same as in vanilla Shiny. For deployment, it also works like in vanilla Shiny. You can either use a push button uh, deployment. Uh, you can click the publish button and deploy it like any other Shiny app. Or you can use rsconnect RS deploy app function or other options uh, which would work for vanilla Shiny as well. So you just need to remember that Rhino is an R package and after initializing its structure, you work with it pretty much like with a Shiny application, but many things will be different as you could see here on this structure. Lastly, you will want to uh, learn more as you go and sometimes you might need help. Uh, two resources that I would like to recommend for that here is first of all, our uh, GitHub, um, GitHub page with full documentation. Uh, you can see the address uh, on the slide right now. Uh, it's also linked to the GitHub repository. And the repository also has a place for discussions. You can go there to ask questions for which you don't find answers in the documentation. It's also a place where you can suggest improvements for Rhino where you can discuss things that don't seem to work as expected. So we might uh, create uh, bugs out of them and start working on fixing them and so on. So this is it for the introduction to Rhino. Let's move on to the next topic, uh, modularization. So first of all, what is modularization? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, as we started working with R uh, Shiny, we really liked how simple it was to start with. You can just have an app.r file and 
So it's pretty much everything you need. You define your UI there, your server, any additional helper functions can also go there. And for some simple demo to showcase the some, some analysis that you have, this is extremely simple, fast, and convenient. But obviously, this is totally unmanageable uh, in the long run. So if your application keeps growing, uh, gets to a couple hundred of lines, or worse, into thousands of lines, you will have very serious trouble, trouble making sense of what's inside that app.r file. And not to mention the fact that typically, uh, at least in our case, each application will be developed by a team. And it's nearly impossible to work on a single file in a team. You really need to split it into smaller, more manageable chunks. And abstractly speaking, this is the goal of modularization. We just want to take our application and split it into smaller chunks, which can be worked on separately, which have clearly defined interface, which make the whole structure of your application way more understandable. So this is the abstract goal, but how do we do that with Rhino? I'm going to tell you about two concrete ways that Rhino approaches the topic of modularization, at least for our code. And this is through Shiny modules and Box modules. So starting with Shiny modules, this is a topic that uh, you might be already familiar with. So a Shiny module is basically a way to split your UI and server into submodules that can be then used to build your application. And this has uh, several benefits. First of all, you, we are getting these smaller chunks which are more manageable and more understandable. Secondly, we can think clearly about what this module does, what kind of inputs it needs, what kind of outputs it provides. And thirdly, it also is crucial to avoid conflicts with the IDs of your inputs and outputs. And what you are looking at is a, an example of a very simple Shiny module, which just displays an input, a text input and a text output. The input asks for your name and the output prints the name. Uh, the message printed there is rendered on the server. Uh, you can see here that the ID that we are passing is wrapped in this NS function which creates a separate namespace for the IDs of your inputs and outputs. And you can, for example, imagine if you have an application with multiple tabs, you might want to make each tab of your application a separate module. This way, you do not need to worry about conflicts of IDs within given tab with IDs with other, in other tabs. You can just focus on the single tab, make sure that it works, and you can be confident that it will work when included in the whole application. So technically, and lastly, technically speaking, a Shiny module is basically a pair of function. The UI function and the server function, they are both functions of ID. They can also take additional arguments, but this is the bare minimum here. And otherwise, it's as simple as that. I'm not going to dive deeper into that because this concept is the same thing that you have in uh, vanilla Shiny. But in a moment, we'll see how this connects with box modules, which is a different concept which Rhino introduces and uses. So what is box? Again, box is an R package which we decided to use in Rhino for a couple of very useful functionalities. And I think it will be best to introduce it by showing a couple of examples. So the first line that we see here, box use deplier and three, three dots uh, in these brackets. This is pretty much the same thing as saying library deplier. So something that you are probably very used, used to if you are working with vanilla R and Shiny. Typically, you would just have a bunch of library calls somewhere at the top of your file well, where you need them. And what this does is attach these packages and bring all the names that are available in those packages into the namespace so that you can use them without any further ado. And for box, you can also kind of simulate that library call 
However, this is not the way a uh, box is intended to be used. Uh, it's just a possibility. But uh, what you can do with box, instead of those three dots, you can actually say the exact functions that you want to import. And looking at the second example, we say box use deplier filter. And this way, we are only importing this filter function and no other functions. Now, why would we want to do that? And the quick answer is that you don't want to, typically you don't want to import all names in a package, especially if you are using many packages, because you will be sometimes having the same exact named function from two different packages, and then depending on the order in which you loaded them, you will get uh, the function either from one package or the other. And so basically using this uh, library form of importing everything pollutes your global namespace. And this becomes quite problematic when you have a lot of packages being used. A second uh, difference, by the way, of using box here uh, is that when you use box use, the imports only apply to this single file where you call box use. On the other hand, when you place, for example, library, library calls in your global.r file that you would have in vanilla shiny, those will apply to the whole project. And again, this is not something we want. Instead, we want each file to be very explicit and specific about which packages and what exact functions from, from those packages are needed. And the last example here uh, is just an alternative way of using box to import the whole package without specifying the exact functions that you want to use, uh, because that can become uh, quite laborsome if you need a lot of functions. So you might want to import the whole package, and then you will be able to use all the functions from it by just referring to them uh, by stating the name of the package, dollar sign, and the name of the function. So these are basics of Box. It's kind of an import system. If you are familiar with Python, for example, Java, or basically any other mainstream language, this is what uh, this is an attempt to bring the same kind of experience to R. Now, Box can be used not only to import packages and functions from packages, but also from files in your application. And to just, again, give you a quick code example, say in, the, in our application, we create a file called constants r in the app slash logic directory. And in that file, we define a single object called answer 42. Then we can import that answer to a different file in a very similar way to importing packages. We just need to provide the path starting with app uh, to, to that constants module. And then we can refer to it as if the constants was a name of a package and answer was an object defined within that package, just like you can see in the example here. One additional thing to notice is that in the constants R file, we had to mark the answer with the export keyword. If we did not do that, we would not be able to import that object in another package. And this is another feature of box uh, that is intended to help you uh, make explicit the interface of each file. We are not showing to the world everything that we write in the file. Uh, we are very explicit about which functions can be used by other files and which functions cannot. And all of this helps to design your application properly. Now, connecting the idea of shiny modules and box module, we get shiny plus box modules. And this looks something like this. Say we create a file called answer.r and add it to the app slash view directory. Inside there, we will create a shiny module. So remember, a pair of functions, UI and server, and mark both of them as exported. Then in a different file, for example, in main.r, we can use those functions in the following way. We just need to use box import at the top to import the answer module. And then we, we will need to uh, place the UI in where we want it to appear by using answer dollar sign UI, providing the ID for the module. 
and we also need to put the server uh, to call the server function uh, of that module. And this is the basic structure that Rhino encourages for structuring your whole application. And you might, uh, you have probably noticed that uh, I was placing these example files either in logic or view directory. And um, a quick explanation about that uh, two directories. So this is something that you get when you initialize Rhino. Uh, we create those two directories for you. Uh, it is not mandatory to use them, but it's a recommendation. You can rename them if you want it, but uh, the idea behind them can really help you to, to structure your code and make it more uh, robust and readable. So the idea is to use logic for all code which can be expressed without Shiny. So if you have some um, algorithm or function which perf performs some data analysis, and this can be done uh, using uh, plain R and some domain-specific helper packages, this is a perfect example of code which should go to your app logic directory. And the app view directory is for everything that defines the user interface of your Shiny application and that connects the components of the interface using reactivity and other Shiny features. And by keeping this uh, separation, uh, you will be able to make your application more testable because the code in app logic does not use Shiny, it's typically easier to write tests for, for that code. And uh, by keeping all the modules in view, uh, specifically with the purpose of building user interface in mind, you will have an application which is much easier to understand just by looking at the file and directory structure. All right, so this is it for the topic of modularization. Let's move on to the topic of dependencies. So again, let's start with a question. Why do we even care about dependencies? So the simplest approach that kind of works as you start playing with R and Shiny is uh, if you need some package, just install it with install packages. So it goes to your global library and just do that as you go whenever you need a package. Again, this is very tempting because it seems so simple, but long term, it's completely unmanageable. And there are two main reasons why this won't work long term. And this relates to the package version uh, and lack of control uh, over it in such a scenario. So imagine that uh, you leave your application for some time. Uh, it used to work. You had all the packages installed. You keep working on some other projects and installing packages uh, as you go. Then you go back to your application and it does not work anymore. So what's the problem? Probably some package got updated, something changed in the way it worked and your application no longer works. And now it will be quite difficult uh, to, to find out which package exactly caused the problem, which version is needed to make it work again, or what kind of fix you need to apply to, to make it work again. And, uh, this can happen to you on your on the same machine, just trying to go back to a project after some time. But this will also happen if you try to run the application on a different machine, whether it's you or your friends trying to help you with the application. If they just install, if they just take a look at all the library calls that you had and try to install all of them, they might end up with different versions than you had. And in turn, it might happen that the application just won't run for them. So this is one big problem. And the second problem is that whenever you're installing a dependency globally in, in your library, this affects all the projects that you have. And quite often you will be having more than one shiny application that you want to work on. So you don't want the version installed for one project to be affecting the version installed for all the other projects. So and there are actually more reasons to care about dependencies, but this is a, these are probably the most important ones. So how do we approach this uh, in a way that is more manageable? So let's talk about the anatomy of the setup that we use in Rhino. So in Rhino, we use the RN package for managing dependencies. 
And again, our end, uh, so let's have a quick look at what, uh, what the structure of this setup looks like. So there are three key components to, to this setup. First of all, there is the dependencies.r file. This is a place where we have a list of libraries that are directly needed by your project. So if anywhere in your project you use, uh, you have box use and some package, that means that this package needs to be added to the dependencies.r file. Then there is the renvlog file, which is not meant to be read by humans. It is generated by our env, and it contains a list of all the dependencies that your project needs, along with their transitive dependencies. So the packages that are needed by the packages that you need. And it also contains the exact version numbers and sources to install those packages. So this is basically the snapshot of your exact library. And the last component is your library. And this is the actual packages that are downloaded and installed for this one given project. And this structure gives you three important properties. Now, starting with the library, you get isolation. And that means that whenever you are installing something into your local library, this package is only installed for this particular project. So it does not affect any other project that you might have on the same machine. Then Renvlog contains all the package versions and it makes sure that you can reproduce the project on a different machine or on the same machine after some time uh, going back to it. And this allows you to really quickly set up your project, uh, whether you are a new developer joining or whether you're just like coming back to your own project. And lastly, this dependencies R file, uh, it's also quite important because uh, it allows us to be very explicit about which dependencies we want in our project. So Renvlog is not really meant to, to be read by humans, like uh, it uses JSON to store the data, but it has lots of information that you don't really care about. You only care about the direct dependencies and you want to be very explicit about what they are and the place to put them in is the dependencies R file. So this is what the setup in Rhino looks like. And uh, one more thing to understand here is how Renv works. So basically, again, I'm assuming some familiarity with Renv because uh, there is not enough time to give an introduction to this package as well. So hopefully you are familiar with taking snapshots uh, of your project library to update the log file. And the key thing to understand about the snapshot is that in the snapshot, you will get saved the packages, which are both deemed dependencies of your project and which are installed in your library. So in Rhino, the setup we use ensures that the dependencies are only read from this dependencies R file. And this is important because in default setup, uh, Red would scan your whole project and we don't want to do that. This is not good if the project grows large uh, and also it lacks this explicitness. So when you are taking a snapshot, Red will take a look at dependencies R and also at what packages are actually installed and the intersection of these two sets will be saved to rent lock. Now, keeping this in fact in mind, we can. Uh, I'm going to show you how to manage dependencies in a Rhino project uh, in the three most common cases. First of all, how do we add a dependency? So the, the first place to always start with is the dependencies R file. We just add a line library deplier. Say we are adding deplier package. Second thing, and this is slightly maybe surprising, uh, second thing to do is to install the package, not update the Renvlog file. And uh, the reason is what I said just a moment ago. Uh, the last step is to take the snapshot, and now the snapshot will save the packages, which are both present in the dependencies R file and which are installed in the library. So these three steps are needed to add a dependency. If we want to update the dependency, we actually don't need to touch the dependencies R file. 
the package is already listed there. The only thing we need to do is to actually install an updated version of the package. We can do that with brand update and then update the log file. We can do that with brand snapshot. And just to show you uh, the last case, how to remove a dependency. Again, this might seem slightly weird, but OK, the first step is again to edit the dependencies R file. This makes a lot of sense. But then instead of trying to use rent remove, my recommendation is to use rent snapshot. This will update the log file and in such a way that the packages, which are no longer listed in the dependencies R, will be removed from uh, the snapshot. And doing it this way is quite important because if you try to call rent remove instead, it will just remove it from the library even if the package is needed by some other dependency. This way, we make sure that the packages, that only the packages which really are not needed any longer are removed. And the last step is to restore the library using this new snapshot. And we pass the clean true argument to also remove the packages which are no longer needed. All right, so these were three examples uh, of uh, how to manage dependencies in Rhino. And this is documented uh, for actually, OK, uh, this was documented on our page. And now a quick sneak, sneak peek into Rhino 1.4. So as you might see, this, this might be a little complicated. And typically, you would want to take a look at the instructions each time you are performing these steps. but Hopefully, it will no longer be the case now, as we will introduce two new functions, which will allow you to perform the same steps in just by just calling a single function. So in Rhino 1.4, you'll get package install, package remove, and this will do all those steps for you. All right, this is it for dependencies. Let's talk SAS and JavaScript. So why do we even need them? Well, the quick answer is that R packages offer limited customization. Up to some point, uh, and if you don't need much customization, you should be able to do with just writing R code and using what's provided by the R packages you are using. But very typically, you will need some additional customization. At least in our project, we almost always need it. And I would say that custom styling is pretty much always a must because uh, our clients want applications which look beautiful and which have fair personal branding. So we pretty much always need custom styling and custom CSS. JavaScript is typically a more advanced use case, but it really opens a world of possibilities. So that's why Rhino also includes setup for both these languages. And now, so how do you use SAS in Rhino? And maybe first of all, what is SAS? So SAS is an extension for CSS. And it's also important to note that it's compatible with CSS. So it's a language where you can just start writing as if you were writing plain CSS. But it has some cool features which you can learn on the go and use uh, when needed, and this will work for you quite well. So in Rhino, if you want to write custom styling, the way to do that is to go to the app slash styles directory, and you'll find the main SDSS file in the directory. So here again, you do not need to put all your styles in that single file. Actually, it, it is very encouraged to use uh, to split your styles into multiple files and to use directory structure to make things more understandable and reasonable. And to import those files, you can use the use directive. directive. And uh, once, you, once you have your styles defined, uh, the last thing that you actually need to do is to call Rhino build SAS. And this will take that, uh, that file that you, that you defined and build it into a minified CSS file, which can be understood by your browser. And it will place it in app static directory. 
and it will include it automatically so that you do not need to actually manually attach the styles. You just need to add the styles there. And after each time you edit it, you need to call Rhino build SAS. What about JavaScript? It's very simple, actually. To add some JavaScript to your project, you open the app.js directory, and you'll find the entry point there, which is called index.js. Again, you are not limited to this single file. You are free to use uh, any custom file and directory structure, and you just use the import statement to, to import other files. Before you can actually see the JS in your application, you will need to build it. And to do that, you use Rhino build JS. And that's pretty much it. One more thing to remember here is uh, the fact that you need to be very explicit, again, about the functions which uh, you are exporting uh, from JS and which you want to use in your R code. So I'm just mentioning, mentioning it here. You can find the details in our documentation. Uh, but if you want to define some function in JavaScript and then use it from R, you will need to mark it with an export keyword. And when using it in R, you will need to prepend an app.prefix there. Again, this makes it very explicit which functions are visible to the world and which functions uh, are not. And uh, one thing to mention here is that uh, with build.js, again, you get some benefits compared to just writing, writing plain JavaScript and attaching it as is to your application. Uh, this JavaScript that you write, uh, we run it through Bubble and Webpack, and this ensures that you can use the latest JavaScript features, including this import keyword, uh, for example, uh, and it will get compiled to a mini file file, which will be included automatically which will be both fast and it will work on any browser. So we don't need to worry about support for a particular feature that you want to use uh, when writing JavaScript. All right, and uh, a quick sneak peek into Rhino 0.4 uh, related to custom JavaScript. So we are planning to introduce the ability to define custom React components and this will work thanks to the machinery present in the Shiny React package. So if you're not familiar with that package and the package is derived from it and with React in general, uh, a, a quick word of information is, so React is a very popular nowadays uh, library for building user interfaces and many great libraries uh, have appeared uh, which are based on React and uh, they allow you to use components like the, the same kind of components that you have in Shiny, but with any style that you can imagine pretty much. So for example, there is Fluent UI, a library coming from Microsoft, and it includes components that can be used to build an interface which feels like a native Microsoft application. And this package using the power of Shiny React is wrapped in our Shiny Fluent package. Uh, and you can use the components from that library after including that package. However, up until now, the use of Shiny React was pretty much limited to uh, building packages to wrap existing React libraries. And with this new release of Rhino, what we want to do is to make it easier to actually write components using React directly in your application. Again, this is somewhat a more advanced use case, but uh, writing React code is actually not that uh, difficult, and it will be much easier now to start, get started with this functionality directly in Rhino. All right, the last topic uh, for today is testing. And again, why automate testing? Why do we care about it? So. Writing tests takes time and it definitely slows you down at the beginning. When you have just a very simple application with uh, not much code, you can do with just manual testing uh, of each new feature that you are introducing. And it seems like a chore and unnecessary work to, to write tests. However, as the project progresses, uh, 
it makes possible to maintain pace. If you are not writing tests, sooner or later, your development will probably stall. I would say that writing automated tests is the only viable option in large applications. Uh, the, the simple reason is that as the application grows, the more you need to test. And it becomes infeasible to manually test the whole application if it's really large. And sooner or later, you'll come to a situation where a small change seems to work in the place that you tested, but it breaks some seemingly unrelated part of the application. And you won't notice that immediately. After some time, you'll find the bug, but now it will be quite difficult to figure out what's going on. You don't know which change introduced that bug exactly. You don't know why it happened. If you keep writing tests, you will hopefully avoid many tests, many issues like that. And running tests, once they are written, is really cheap. You just need to run a single function, and you get automated testing of your whole application. So that's why we care about it. And what about testing in Rhino? So let's start with a topic that is not exactly testing, but it's related. And I figured it, this is a place where it would fit well, linters. These are tools which can automatically read your code and find uh, style errors in that. And it is very important to use linters because uh, first of all, they ensure consistency of your code. This means the code is easier to read and there's like less uh, work discussing style issues with your colleagues. And you also can sometimes discover some bugs. Uh, Ill-formatted code can, can lead to bugs and running linter can hopefully help you avoid many of those bugs. Rhino comes with linters for other languages that you might be using. So for linting R, JS, and SAS, we have this lint R, lint JS, and lint SAS functions. There are actually also functions for automatically formatting your code. For R, this is format R. And for, for uh, JS and SAS, you can just pass the fix through flag to, to the appropriate function, and many errors can be fixed automatically this way. Then uh, Rhino comes with setup for unit tests and end-to-end -end tests. And again, I'm not going to dive into details here. Unit tests in Rhino use test that, and they live in the tests test that directory. You can just run them with Rhino test R. Very similarly, end-to-end -end tests live in the test Cypress directory, and you can run them with Rhino test end-to-end. And Cypress is a technology based on JavaScript. So to write uh, tests using Cypress, you will need to write uh, in JavaScript. However, the benefits can be quite huge. End-to-end -end tests are able to launch your whole application, interact with it, and verify things like, is some element visible? Did some text appear? Uh, does some button work, or is it disabled? And so on. And this really brings end-to-end -end testing to a whole new level. Uh, by the way, in Rhino, you can also use uh, Shiny Test 2 package for writing end-to-end -end tests. Uh, however, with Cypress, uh, I would say you have quite a bit more possibilities. And lastly, all these tools uh, wouldn't be of much use if you didn't run them. So Rhino comes with a setup for continuous integration. If you Keep your project in GitHub. We will automatically run all the linters for you, the unit tests and end-to-end -end tests, and you will get a report telling you if everything went fine or if there were any issues. And you don't need to actually remember to run all those things uh, manually. Last mention, a sneak peek into Rhino 1.4 actually this is something that we already have, but uh, finally, we have end-to-end -end tests for the whole Rhino package. Uh, so just a quick note here, Rhino is quite a challenging project to test uh, because it combines multiple other tools and some system dependencies, and it's not just plain our code that can be easily tested a lot of the time. But we managed to create some really nice workflows for running uh, the package itself end to end. And again, this increases our confidence in the correctness of the package. 
And this is yet another thing that comes will come with Rhino 1.4. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so in summary, we had some introduction to Rhino. We talked about modularization, dependencies, SAS and JavaScript and testing. I know this was a little bit fast. Uh, there is a lot of ground to cover. In the future, I might decrease the amount of topics even further. Right now, let's jump into the Q&A session. Uh, so Jakub Nowitzki should join us now. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Camille, for walking us through the key concepts surrounding Rhino. And uh, welcome, Kuba. And uh, we, we do have a few questions that we can address. So I'll go with the first question. Uh, Niels wanted to know, how do we pass data and reactive values between box modules? All right, so basically, um, I guess uh, it's a bit hard to answer without uh, examples. So now I'm um, kind of sad that I did not do some leaf coding, uh, then I would just jump in there and present you it. However, uh, I would say the recommended uh, way to pass reactive values around Shiny application is to use the arguments to your Shiny module. So as I mentioned, when you're defining a function uh, for your Shiny module, it will take an ID it can also take additional arguments, and this can be reactive values. And box does not really change here anything. If you understand how to do that in vanilla Shiny, you should use the same approach in real Rhino application, and you should be good. So you just add arguments for the server function, and you pass the reactive values in and out this way. Thank you. Um, Malikas has a question, uh, which auth package is best with Rhino Shiny for production applications? Okay, I can jump in. Uh, recently, we added uh, support for Shiny uh, Manager, so this is one solution you can use. Uh, but in general, uh, we also recommend uh, using uh, things like authorization in uh, Posit Connect or in Shiny Apps.io. You can always uh, also use, of course, uh, Shiny Proxy. All those solutions uh, provide you a authentication for your Shiny application. Okay, I think that answers these questions, but uh, let he has another question. How do you work with Auth in Shiny for Rhino? For Sorry, uh, there was another question. Let me show that. Okay, I, I don't see it anymore. Okay, so we have uh, piggyback questions from Brent over here. He wants to know how to pass values when box modules are nested in multiple levels. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And uh, so this is, I would say, again, something, uh, in my opinion, not uh, directly related to box. Uh, box is just a way to split your files, uh, your code across multiple files. What comes into play here is the nesting of the Shiny modules themselves. You have a, if you have a module and inside of that you have more modules and then they have even deeper modules. And those modules at the deepest level need some reactive values from the top level. Then yes, one option is to pass it through arguments all the way down. Other option uh, is probably to rethink how your application is structured. Maybe this nesting in this case doesn't uh, really help and maybe you need a flatter structure. Yet another option, uh, but I think uh, typically this should be considered as a last resort, is to pass values through, through the session object. In the session object, and again, this is a feature of vanilla Shiny, this is not really strictly related to, to Rhino. Uh, there is something like session data, and you can store pretty much anything there, and all the modules have access to that. So if you truly need something that is really global to the session, that might be the place to, to go. 
However, uh, typically you will want to pass those uh, things through arguments, make sure that the structure makes sense so you don't need to go too deep with that. Awesome. Um, Juan wants to know, do you recommend using Shiny dashboard with Rhino? Uh, of course, if, you, if Shiny dashboard is something you want to use, uh, you can definitely use it with Rhino. Uh, in general, there, is, there are plenty of uh, similar packages that uh, are aimed to, to, to give you the nice UI. And uh, yeah, Shiny dashboard, we can also recommend uh, our uh, semantic dashboard, which is uh, kind of a similar, but uh, provides you the UI from uh, Shiny semantic. So yeah, the sky is the limit. While we are at it, can we talk about Rhinoverse? I know that uh, Kuba, you're working with Rhinoverse. Yeah, so uh, Rhinoverse in general is uh, a set of packages built around Rhino that provide uh, various features like the uh, UI components, uh, like uh, routing, like uh, internationalization. So uh, there are plenty of things that you can do uh, in Rhino applications, but also in uh, in regular Shiny applications using some packages from Rhinoverse. And uh, probably the best place to start is to uh, visit rhinoverse.dev, our uh, landing page for, for this uh, family of packages, and uh, just explore. Thank you. Um, Luis has a question. Uh, would it be possible to add some examples on how to do this in Rhino website? I think that would be really helpful. So, well, Please to take a look, uh, first of all, at the tutorial section, the tutorial section that we have. Also, the how-to guides uh, have some examples for, for the particular topics that they cover. Uh, but of course, uh, you are working on expanding the documentation. Uh, if you have specific issues uh, or like trying to do something with Rhino and finding it difficult to, to figure out uh, how to do that, uh, I, I would also recommend to going to GitHub discussions and asking there. Uh, hopefully, you'll get uh, an example either from us or maybe from somebody else from the community. And uh, with time, we are including those examples in the documentation as well. So yes, it, it will grow bigger and bigger for sure. Last resource to recommend, uh, this is also uh, linked from the documentation page. There are past talks about Rhino, and uh, there were quite a few already. Uh, some of those talks had uh, actual leaf coding, and there are also uh, presentations available there. So yeah, these are all the resources that you can use to, to get more examples. Uh, but yeah, if you need something specific, don't hesitate to, to ask. Tyler has a question. Uh, will your team continue to build out online learning materials? And specifically, he's referring to how-to guides uh, that are present there. Well, I guess Camille already answered that question. Yes, we are constantly uh, trying to improve our documentation and extend it with uh, various, various topics. Uh, Niels has another question. Do you have any examples on how to run Rhino app in a Docker container? Uh, yes, there is actually such an example. It's not a use case that we, I would say, very officially support, uh, or rather it's not maybe our focus to, to make sure that it works in Docker. But uh, there is something called uh, Rhino Showcase, uh, I'm quite sure this you can also find you can find it in Google, uh, but uh, you can also find it linked somewhere from the documentation. And this is an example application built uh, using Rhino to showcase its various features. And one of the things it has uh, is a Docker file, which allows you to to build a container with this application and run it uh, using that application. So there there we have an example of using Docker. Uh, yes, we also have an example of a Docker file in the documentation uh, if you uh, look for a hugging face, how to guide. Because uh, in hugging face, uh, 
shiny applications also use Docker. So this is something, uh, some some kind of a start uh, starting place for you. Okay. Uh, unknown man wants to know why would you prefer uh, Shiny over Power BI or Tableau? Yeah, we're talking about Rhino here, but uh, yeah, would anyone of you like to take that? This is a very wide topic, and uh, I'm not sure if if. Uh, we will be able to cover it all. But in general, it's uh, usually it's up to your needs. If you need something very customizable, uh, you probably need to go with Shiny. If uh, it's kind of a standard dashboard, maybe Power BI or Tableau is, is a way to go for you. Uh, they're, they're just apples and oranges. Yes, and uh, I, I think I would add that, uh, OK, I might be kind of skewed in one direction here, but um, like uh, tools which kind of are designed to, to do some very specific things, uh, typically do those very specific things quite well, but as soon as you need something more, you'll have great trouble trying to, to do that. And Shiny definitely extends uh, like what you can do quite a lot here because uh, you're writing code, you are using add-on packages, you can do pretty much whatever you, you want here. And uh, like just like comparing, it's like, I wouldn't try uh, implementing a complex application in Excel. I, I would definitely use it for simple calculations. That's the fastest thing to, to do if an Excel spreadsheet is exactly what I need. But as soon as uh, I need something more, I, I would prefer something uh, more robust. And, but yeah, it boils down to what you need. OK. Stephen wants to know, how does Rhinoverse differ from Golemverse? So as far as I uh, remember, Golemverse is like uh, the Golem package and two, two more packages, like Ipsum something and something more. So these are just, uh, I, I think, three packages which came from, uh, from Think R. Uh, as far as I remember, I'm sorry if I'm wrong about this. Uh, with Rhinoverse, uh, we have way more packages and they were developed over, over the years. Uh, I did not count them, actually, so I'm not sure how many we have. Uh, but yeah, I would say the different, the main difference is that uh, it's just a completely different set of packages and uh, developed uh, from from scratch over over the years. So just like two quite different things. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name, but. This person wants to know, um, are there any thoughts on using Babel with Rhino? So any other thoughts? Uh, maybe a, a quick uh, thought about uh, the future of Babel in Rhino. Uh, I think in the future, we might actually simplify the tool chain a bit. I did not mention it in the talk, but uh, what powers those functions like build.js and build SaaS is Node.js, which is kind of state of the art uh, tool chain now for building web applications. And that's why we use that. Uh, and again, Bubble was, um, and probably still is the, the most popular thing out there. So that's why it is used in Rhino. But in the future, we might be simplifying uh, things a bit. So I'm not sure if it will be always needed. But uh, I do think that right now it's, it does bring uh, some value. Like it allows you to use any of the latest uh, JavaScript features without worrying whether they will work in the target browser or not, because everything is transpiled to uh, JavaScript uh, code, which should work on pretty all uh, browsers. So that's the main benefit uh, that I see here. But there is certainly room for improvements in the future. Brent has a great question that I've seen a lot of people struggle with. So the Rhino app structure makes developing module modularity intuitive. 
but what what about the granularity of the modules so yeah i think uh, it's hard to give a comprehensive answer so just like a quick thought this is a broad and general question about software engineering and uh, system design i would say uh, the the approach that i typically take when designing well just like any any system is uh, splitting modules as I go. I typically don't have a complete idea of what the, how the application will look like uh, from the beginning. Uh, when I tried approaching things this way, it typically did not work that well. I, I still found that uh, the modules are related in ways that I did not expect, and code which I thought could actually go separately needed to live together. So I think what works better is to start with uh, single module in some sense uh, or with a, just a small amount of modules of which you are very sure and then whenever you see that it becomes difficult to work with some um, some module that's the time to go more granular this, this is the approach that i personally use uh, it works quite well for me uh, so just like yeah, design as you go in, in some sense. But of course, uh, do anticipate too. Like, it's good to have an idea in mind, like how things will look like uh, in the future. It's just like hard to um, know everything from the beginning. And yeah, I would say that uh, you need more gra granularity when uh, a particular module is no longer easy to work with. and then it's time to try to split it better. Thank you, Kamil. Uh, I think we've answered all the questions that was asked. So thank you, Kamil, for the terrific presentation. And thank you, Kuba, for joining us. Thank you so much. It was a thank pleasure you. to present. Uh, and I want to thank uh, all of the uh, people for joining us today. And I hope now you have a deeper understanding of Rhino after the presentation from Camille. Uh, we encourage joining the Slack channel uh, with the community of fellow Shiny enthusiasts. I can't wait for the next Shiny gathering on July 25th, the last Tuesday of July, where we'll be joining with Verle uh, as she reveals the secrets of asynchronous programming in Shiny, building up on her key, keynote uh, of Shiny Conference 2023. Virle will dive deep into practical examples of async programming in Shiny, explore the power of packages like Future Promises, Collar, and Coro, and learn how to leverage the, the potential of creating lightning fast, seamless applications ex experiences. Once again, thank you so much for joining. Stay curious and stay inspired. And until next time.